so one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, uh, going on the ISEX. Yeah. I got the privilege of going on uh, the ISEX in 2004 with the the Hampton. Uh, we went up there with HMS Tireless. Uh, we had uh, it was, uh, pr- a perfect, perfect underway. We had no problems. One of the things that I really enjoyed uh, about that underway is we got to kind of battle them. You know, we will do like war games out there. You know, if you got two subs out there, you just send them out there and they got an extra day or two, let them battle each other and see who's better. You know, and we had a lot of fun with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I argue with the guys because I know some guys that are actually on the tireless on, on Twitter and I argue with them. But I think we won most of the because we it was like 10 of them and we won the most. And uh, we actually our captains bet um, that uh, whoever won. So if we won, we would get uh, beer because you guys will carry uh, beer underway with you guys. And ever since we put in General Order 99 or whatever back in the before the 20s, I think, where we haven't had beer on our boats for a long time. So it's like, hey, so you you trade us some beer. If you guys win, we'll give you our soft serve ice cream. The tireless wasn't carrying ice cream at the time. And so we ended up, we ended up having a good time and uh, we battled or whatever. And the, the Navy was like, absolutely not. You guys cannot have a keg of beer. There's no way. Uh, but instead, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll send you guys back to uh, Plymouth and you guys can port there and, and have a week there and enjoy that. So it was, we had a lot of fun even after we went to the ISEX, but uh, uh, went up there with HMS Tireless. They were a great crew. Oh, cool. We actually surfaced close enough to each other that we got to walk to each other's boat. And uh, I ended up. Yeah, I ended up getting a little uh, frostbite in my toe because there's, you know, yeah. when you walk on the ice, it's just ice. So every once in a while, it'll swallow like your whole leg. <laughs> and I was pulling my boot, my my leg out, and I was packing ice into my boot. It was, but it was fun. We had a we had a really good time out there. But um, you had a you actually had a, an interesting ice ax. You know, ours was pretty uneventful. I think every every submarine that goes up there probably has close calls with with icebergs. So you do emergency deeps, and it's you know it's crazy and. But you have a, a particularly interesting story because you were a Royal Submariner that went up there on a U.S. boat. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience up there with ISEX. Yeah, sure. So, so um, uh, ISEX in 2007. Uh, so I, I worked for um, Comsubd Devron 12 at the time. And one of my responsibilities as uh, coordinated operations officer was uh, running the uh, TAC dev for, for ISEX. So I led the planning and uh, had a great team from from the US Navy and also Atlas helping plan the entire ISEX. Flew up to Prudhoe Bay and then out onto the ice, which is an experience that's impossible to forget. Um, just, just amazing uh, to go out to the ice camp and then waited for USS Alexandria to surface through the ice, which was equally amazing to see a submarine surface through the ice while she stood on the same ice. That's just, just crazy. And then we dived, I got on board, we dived and we started off on a series of uh, exercises. But unfortunately, tragically, there was uh, an explosion on board uh, Tireless at the time, it was about four in the morning. And basically, they'd had, and, and I'll tell you what we observed and then I can explain what happened, although it's well known what happened at the time. So, so I remember being in the... Um, uh, in the control room, and then you heard the sonar press report that they'd heard an explosion, a small explosion, and then you could hear Tyler speeding up in speed. So my first uh, reaction out of that is if she's speeding up, they've had an explosion, don't know what that, what that is, but if, they, if they're speeding up and they think they've got a flood, because that's the standard EOP, emergency operating procedure under ICE, um, is to speed up 16 knots so you can contain any ingress uh, or the, the, the weight that comes with the ingress of water until you can find a polynia, which is basically a gap in the ice to surface. And then they were talking on the underwater telephone, but they were talking on the underwater telephone in their emergency breathing system. So so you could hear that. And they went, oh my God, they've got a fire as well, obviously. Um, so she surfaced and then we just stayed with her, obviously depth separated, stayed with her and just waited for instructions effectively. So working on those two bits alone, we all sat down as a group to try and work out what support we could give to her if, if the damage was really considerable. So the case of, uh, like you said, surfacing close by, maybe rafting up um, and then providing safe haven for the team to come over, whatever they needed, we, we should be able to provide that. And then and then we stopped with that. And then I remember um, the captain at the time, uh, Mike Bernacki, I'd, I'd gone to, to bed. Uh, I didn't sleep, obviously, that much, but then he called me up to tell me that um, uh, two of the crew had uh, died and the third was being airlifted to uh, a military hospital. And uh, and that was really, really, really shocking uh, to hear that, that um, 
two people have lost lost their lives there. But the um, then the whole piece of leadership comes into it. So Ian Breckenridge, who's the who was the captain of Tardis at the time, he needed to get the submarine back to the UK. So it's all about making the submariners, checking the submarines safe, motivating your crew again, despite the fact that they've lost two of their shipmates and a third is very seriously uh, injured and managed to, they dived, I think it was about 24 hours later, uh, did their final checks. One last comms over underwater telephone and then they went back under the under the ice and returned to the UK. And we carried on doing just some self stuff, noise measuring and stuff like that until we surfaced again and I left and flew back to Groton. But yeah, on board, I mean, I, I used to do a talk with uh, Ian Breckenridge because obviously I had the loss of the air conditioning plants and multiple casualties. And he and I used to go around and talk together about both of our challenges. And he was he was just incredible that day, how he led um, his team and got them back. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So could you could you tell us well, what you think f- happened? Like what happened? Like what, what was the explosion? Yeah, they know they know what happened. I mean, they did um, they did a huge investigation into it. So two young sailors um, were doing well. One was teaching the other how to use the new oxygen candles, and they ignited it as you would do standard, and then it exploded. And the explosion was in the forward escape compartment, which is quite a cramped uh, place. In one of the side compartments, there was a was a another sailor who survived the first um, the first explosion, and as he stepped out, he was the vision. I, you know, I can't even imagine what he thought at the time, which was two casualties, uh, multiple fires everywhere. The access uh, plates were buckled, so he's trying to deal with that. Um, equally, the submarine filled with smoke quite rapidly, um, and equally, the man at the manual. Uh, flood alarm had been set off by the explosion, which is why they sped up to 16 knots. The smoke went right the way through the forward part of the submarine, pretty much filled the forward part of the submarine. Um, and the firefighting crews got ready and off they went up towards the forward escape in order to try and sort the problem out. But the problem is, is that they couldn't get any access. It took them over 20 minutes to get access because of the buckled floor plates. So actually, the one person who was dealing with all of it and some of the tough choices he had was putting out the fires and or trying to save life at the same time. So he kept going until they could break in and then they extinguished the fires and brought control to the submarine. So, and, and the root cause of that was that the oxygen candle, and I think this is in the report as well, but the oxygen candle, when it was on shore, had been stored incorrectly. And therefore, when it was ignited on the submarine and using a standard operating procedure, it exploded. Right. And so I want to explain a little bit about oxygen candles. Uh, and this story, this storm it really hits me close because I was an A-ganger on uh, the Hampton and I lit, oh man, I bet you I, I, bet you I lit over 200 of those candles the, the, the time I served on that boat. And the, the candles in this case were a tad bit different, but the candles we used were in these green canisters. And what you do is there's a, it looks, it looks like a nail. And on the tip of the nail, there's a, a, like a red phosphorus that they use for matches. And you stick it inside the candle and then you spin it it in the candle and when you do that it will ignite whatever that chemical is inside there and it gets super duper hot it'll like emit oxygen that you can breathe so if you don't have your oxygen generator up or you, your oxygen banks are low you can't use them or you want like you said you wanted to stay quiet you can you can produce oxygen burning these candles and they don't make any noise at all i mean you you can make noise loading them because they're in these big metal you know ovens but generally they're they're really dangerous I and mean, when when we were on an underway one time we were doing what we called uh, hot change outs which is where you take the old candle out while it's still burning and the, i mean these things are like 400 degrees i think we would give it about 10 minutes to cool off and then we'd pull it out with oven mitts and then we would load a cold one in there and we'd light it again and that was how we were producing oxygen that underway and it was so hot that the oven and all of the metal had expanded and we couldn't get the lid back on. And so we were like kicking it and pushing it with our boots. And me and the guy that were on watch actually melted the bottom of our boots off on that oven because those oxygen candles burned so hot. And uh, it's interesting to hear that story about this particularly because I had lit so many of them and they didn't tell us it was ever like an explosion hazard. I never knew anything about that. But then you said, you know, well, they stored it wrong. They put oil in it. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. You know, if you just pour a bunch of oil in something that's, you know, hundreds of degrees and more than likely it's not going to turn out very well. And it's super important. This stuff gets stored correctly. Yeah. And to, to me, this is nothing to do with the crew itself. The crew knew nothing about that, how they'd been stored. So um, the tragedy was that leading weapons engineer, Paul McKernan, Weapons engineer Anthony Hunt Rod lost their lives because of that poor storage. 
they followed every procedure as they should have done and that they could never have known that was going to happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a very tragic day, a very tragic day, obviously. And, and it showed, but it also showed that once again, how, how amazing submariners can be in dealing with really, really tough situations and recovering from them. <laughs> <laughs> 